Hi, I'm Geneviève Bois, and I practice family medicine in Nunavik. And I'm René Whitmer, and I practice as a family physician in Montreal. Today, we're going to talk about level of care. This can include talking about cardiopulmonary resuscitation, also known as CPR. But what is a level of care exactly? A level of care is the expression of the values and preferences of a patient in the form of healthcare goals. Often, what reminds us that we need to discuss the level of care with a patient is an admission to the hospital or a visit to the emergency room with an acute issue. In those moments, we are reminded that we really need to know, what do you want us to do if you have a cardiac arrest? Do you want us to try to restart your heart? It is an important question because in an urgent situation, the medical team will need to make a very quick decision, and sometimes this means they won't have the time to discuss with you or a relative. Although doctors often think to discuss the level of care of a patient during the admission to the hospital, it is not the only moment to discuss this. We actually should discuss the level of care in many other situations. You can also imagine that when one is quite sick or being urgently brought to the hospital, it's not always an ideal moment to have a good conversation about something like the level of care. The level of care is determined during a discussion between a patient and their physician, or if the patient is unable to provide informed consent with the representative. This discussion is held in the spirit of shared decision-making about medically appropriate care and involves taking into consideration the global condition of a patient. A level of care should be periodically reviewed as the patient's condition changes, that their life expectancy changes, that their level of autonomy changes, or simply when a person's preferences have evolved. A level of care that was appropriate 10 years ago, 5 years ago, or even 1 year ago may not be suitable today. So what are the four different levels of care? Level of care A is prolonging life by all possible care. The medical team will undertake all possible and appropriate healthcare interventions, including CPR, intubation, or transferring a patient to the intensive care unit or a different center. Level of care B is prolonging life with various interventions, but with some limitations. The interventions that will be undertaken will still attempt to correct the issues and prolong life, but keeping in mind that quality of life will also need to be preserved. Certain interventions will therefore be excluded. For example, a patient might choose that they would want to have a tube put in to help them breathe, but that they don't want us to restart their heart if ever it stops. Or someone else could decide that they are fine with going to the intensive care unit, but that they don't want to be intubated, which means having that tube put in the mouth all the way to your lungs with a machine breathing for you. In level of care C, the goal is to ensure comfort over prolonging life. The person's comfort is prioritized through active management of their symptoms. Interventions that can correct reversible health problems will still be performed, but only if the means are judged acceptable by the patient. It's not that we don't try to prolong life, but it's that quality of life and comfort are prioritized over duration of life. We usually avoid invasive or painful interventions with this level of care. For example, a woman living in a nursing home with a level of care C may want to receive antibiotics necessary to treat her pneumonia at home, but will want to avoid a transfer to the hospital. For a lot of patients, staying at home surrounded by friends and family until the end is of crucial importance. In level of care D, the goal is to ensure comfort without prolonging life. Care is aimed at maintaining comfort by all necessary means. The illness is left to its natural course and we will intervene only if the symptoms of the disease are causing discomfort. We often refer to level of care D as comfort care. Of note, it is important to make the difference between cardiac arrest, which we've been discussing, and what we call a heart attack. Cardiac arrest means we have no pulse. Our heart, which is a pump, simply does not beat in a coordinated fashion anymore. A heart attack is quite different. It means your heart is still working, but is lacking some oxygen. The treatment is very different and will involve giving medications or opening blockages in the arteries of the heart. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation is a series of actions that are taken when your heart stops beating. The goal is getting it to beat on its own again. This may include thoracic compressions, which are vigorous compressions of the thorax to stimulate the heart's pumping function while it's stopped. This is also known as a cardiac massage, which has nothing to do with the type of massage one receives in a spa. Resuscitation may also include intubation, so putting a tube down one's throat that goes all the way to the lungs, which is then connected to a machine to make the person artificially breathe. It can also include defibrillation, which are types of electric shocks given to the heart to try and restart it. It also involves giving various medications, always with the goal of restarting the heart, as well as placing various tubes like catheters and blood vessels, urinary catheters, a feeding tube, etc. As you can see, CPR has little to do with what is shown on TV and in movies. In truth, 
It only works in a fraction of the cases, and the person needs to be hospitalized for a prolonged period after resuscitation. All of these actions aim to restart the heart and re-establish spontaneous circulation, and in some way bring you back to life. However, there are many possible harms associated with resuscitation when it works. Rib fractures, which are the consequence of effective thoracic compressions. Prolonged bedridden and prolonged hospitalization after resuscitation, which are associated with complications of their own. Generally, patients need to be hospitalized in the intensive care unit following resuscitation. Depending on the cause of cardiopulmonary arrest, the duration of the stay in the intensive care unit can vary from a few days to a few weeks, but can even last months in some cases. The resuscitation maneuvers and the prolonged hospitalization can lead to a loss of autonomy, which may be reversible, but may require a transfer to a physical rehabilitation facility after hospital discharge. Patients often mention they want to be resuscitated, but only if they'll be able to maintain the same level of autonomy afterwards. Unfortunately, it's often impossible to guarantee what autonomy will be left following cardiopulmonary resuscitation. One question we hear a lot is, does resuscitation work? One has to know the survival rate varies a lot, but the first question is, what does it really mean to you to survive cardiac arrest? Does it mean surviving the arrest itself, or surviving the admission to the hospital, or being able to go home in a state similar to before? Some people will survive the initial cardiac arrest, but will die in the hours or the days following. It means they won't leave the hospital. The survival rate depends on multiple factors, but mostly it depends on the condition of the person before the arrest takes place. What age they were, how many illnesses did they have, and which illnesses did they suffer from. Also, where the arrest happens matters. One has more chances of surviving it if it happens in a hospital than if it happens in the street or at home when there's not anybody present and it might take a while to be found. In addition, the speed at which the resuscitation attempts end up working make a huge difference. The longer it takes before the heart restarts and the blood flow is restored, the worse the prognosis is. Finally, the cause of the arrest also matters, but we can't really know this in advance. To give you an idea, if 100 people have a cardiac arrest in a hospital, Between 6 and 19 of them will survive long enough to be able to be discharged from the hospital, albeit not always with the same functional level than before. Choosing a level of care B, C, or D does not mean not doing anything. It's choosing certain interventions of care over others. The care remains of the same quality. Even if one wants what we call palliative care, it doesn't mean not doing anything. It simply means changing the goal from curing at all costs to comfort and quality of life at all costs. It does not mean doing less in quantity of care. It's also a myth to think that the level of care A is the appropriate level of care for everyone. While it may be true that level of care A is acceptable to many patients, it's important to ensure that the level of care reflects each person's unique situation and their personal preferences, as well as potential harms and benefits associated with each option. Many people believe level of care A is the best because it involves doing everything. It's important to note that it does involve doing everything possible to prolong life, including painful or invasive maneuvers. It's also appropriate for a person to choose another level of care and still do a lot for them, even if the goal is not to prolong life at all costs. Why is it important to talk about level of care? The level of care you pick influences a lot. It changes if you will go to the hospital or not if you're ill, if you'll go to a general ward or the ICU, if we'll attempt resuscitation or not if your heart stops. It influences where you'll spend your last hours or last days and in which condition you'll be. Will you be at home? Will you be with friends or family? Will you be able to communicate with them? Having a clear level of care makes sure that there's a concordance between the care you want and the care you receive. It also means you will not be subjected to interventions that can be painful if they're not part of the care you want. Unwanted care can be quite distressing, both for you or for relatives, and that's why we want to avoid it. Despite advancements in knowledge and medical technologies, the results of interventions like resuscitation are extremely variable. When harms and potential benefits need to be weighed carefully, it's absolutely legitimate to ask yourself which maneuvers you would want and which ones you wouldn't want. There's a few reasons why it's particularly important to discuss your level of care in the context of the current COVID-19 epidemic. With the current epidemic, the way we perform resuscitation interventions had to change, which worsens the prognosis of a cardiac arrest. The members of a team need to don various pieces of personal protective equipment to protect themselves and other patients before they start the resuscitation. Risks and contamination are very high during CPR. 
This donning of protective equipment creates a delay before starting resuscitation. This means the chances that CPR works are likely much lower than before. It also means the chances that there are negative impacts on the autonomy or quality of life of a person who would survive cardiac arrest are likely higher. It's early to say for sure what the numbers will be, but clearly the prognosis will be worse than usually. Furthermore, also because of the current COVID-19 epidemic, hospitals have to limit visitors to reduce transmission. This means that if you're hospitalized, you're likely to receive little to no visitors during your hospital stay. It also means that some patients may die without the possibility of being surrounded by friends and relatives towards the end of life. Again, in the context of the COVID epidemic, people who have contracted COVID sometimes need to be intubated because we're not managing to keep their oxygen concentration high enough with applications of oxygen under nose and mouth. Until now, the data is not encouraging for people with COVID that need to be intubated. Depending on studies, half, two-thirds, and sometimes nearly all the patients that are intubated have died in hospital. The chances of being able to breathe again without a machine, which is what we call being extubated, were better for young patients. But with increasing age, increasing chronic illnesses, and certain illnesses like diabetes and heart disease, the prognosis of surviving intubation was poor. It can be difficult or scary to talk about end of life, goals of care, or level of care. Nobody likes to imagine themselves as sick or dying. But not discussing your preferences may lead to other issues, like receiving care you didn't want, or finding yourself weakened after an intervention or hospital stay that you didn't want either, or even dying in the hospital when you would have preferred to die at home. It can also lead to a relative having to take a decision for you if you're unable to express your preferences, sometimes without knowing your exact preferences regarding the care you will receive. Finally, it's important to remember that when we talk about level of care, there is no right or wrong decision. There is only the best decision for you in your unique situation. We hope this video has been useful and will encourage you to discuss level of care with your physician and with people close to you.